So I'd like to welcome everyone this evening to uh, this webinar with uh, Dr. Ben Dome. He'll be presenting uh, his presentation, The Athlete's Hip Injury Prevention, Diagnosis and Treatment. Dr. Dome is a, a nationally and I would argue internationally recognized orthopedic surgeon specializing in sports medicine and arthroscopic surgery of the hip, shoulder and knee. A noted pioneer in advanced new techniques in hip arthroscopy. He delivers innovative treatment for patients with hip injuries, such as impingement and labral tears. For most people on this call, we've had a, an incredible uh, relationship with Dr. Dome for the past decade and, and don't need to speak to all the other accolades. Uh, you know, Cornell residency, fellowship trained anywhere that matters. Um, so with that, we'd just really like to, to welcome Dr. Dome. Thanks very much, Thomas. It's uh, an honor to present for ATI and uh, to interact with um, so many ATI uh, therapists and clinicians, especially uh, during this difficult time uh, when, uh, when, it is, uh, when it is hard for people to get together in person. Um, so um, I'll uh, speak to you tonight about the athlete's hip uh, injury prevention, diagnosis, and treatment. Next, please. Great. So before I launch into telling you all about the hip, I, I'd like to say that I feel the phys physical therapists and athletic trainer and clinicians are perhaps the most important piece of medical care for orthopedic problems. Uh, and the reason that uh, I feel that way is that the uh, therapist or uh, trainer has the ability to bridge the gap between uh, diagnosis and treatment. And specifically has the opportunity to make the diagnosis in a lot of cases where the diagnosis has not been made. So I'll talk later in the talk about how common misdiagnosis is in the world of hip injuries, but a, a surgeon or a, a doctor tends to spend five or 10 or tw uh, 20 minutes with uh, a patient. A physical therapist tends to spend hours with a patient repeatedly uh, uh, two to three times a week for weeks on end. Uh, so the therapist uh, spends a lot more time with the patient than the doctor and uh, often is in a position to recognize when there is a misdiagnosis or an incomplete diagnosis. If a patient is uh, sent to you with a diagnosis of, uh, of uh, back pain, for example, and uh, you find that their back pain is getting better with therapy, but they still have pain wrapping around the side of their hip, you may uh, astutely assess that, in fact, there was a back problem indeed, but there was also a hip problem uh, and a plethora of other uh, misdiagnoses or mixed diagnoses that uh, the therapist is in a position to uh, correct. And when you make that right diagnosis, you make a big difference in a patient's life. Uh, you take a patient who uh, was struggling to get the right uh, treatment because they don't have a complete diagnosis, and you get them on the right track, and that makes a huge difference too. So, so I hope you'll have the opportunity to do that. Sorry, a little feedback. I hope you all have the opportunity to do that in your career, uh, and I know you'll have that opportunity if uh, you're paying attention to hip injuries. Uh, next slide, please. So I, I would like to tell you a little bit about the American Hip Institute, uh, which is uh, an institution that is the first in the country to uh, focus specifically on cutting edge treatments of the hip. Uh, and from a surgical standpoint, has uh, led the way in arthroscopic and robotic uh, hip surgery. Next slide, please. Um, and uh, as I introduce this area, I would normally ask you for a show of hands. Uh, who uh, here has seen someone with hip pain? Who has had hip pain? Uh, who believes sports can be good for the hip? And next. Uh, who believes that sports can hurt the hip? So if you consider all these questions, I, I, I'm going to guess that there are a lot of hands virtually going up right now uh, for all of these questions. Uh, and the answer is probably yes to all of them for most of us. Uh, next, please. Um, so I want to tell you how I got interested in the hip uh, because I think it uh, may 
uh, enlighten you, uh, and uh, hopefully we'll get some of you interested in the hip uh, as well. Uh, I played basketball through college at uh, Princeton, was an athlete myself, like most athletes, uh, endured my own share of injuries, and that's part of how I got interested in orthopedic surgery. Uh, next, please. I uh, went on to uh, play basketball uh, uh, professionally in Spain, and um, uh, here uh, you see uh, me at a height of six foot seven, looking rather small, uh, next to the much taller uh, Manupo, uh, which uh, is my slide to uh, show you the uh, principle of always wanting to grow and get bigger. Uh, you can take the metaphor. Um, I, I wanted to, to grow uh, the field of orthopedic surgery. I wanted to uh, help uh, advance the field and um, find, uh, help patients who were not being helped. And that's what led me to, uh, to the hip. Next, please. Um, so I, I went on and played um, through my playing career. Next, please. Uh, before uh, realizing I'd probably be a better doctor than a basketball player. Next, please. Uh, and I uh, went on to medical school at Johns Hopkins and then did my uh, sports medicine fellowship with Frank Job at the Curlin Job Clinic. Uh, and you see uh, him pictured here. Uh, now, um, I, I want to mention Dr. Job and tip my hat to him because he was really my inspiration uh, for uh, innovation. Um, you uh, have probably heard of the man in the upper left, which is Tommy John. Uh, Tommy was a baseball player in the 1970s who tore his ulnar collateral ligament in his elbow. And at the time, that was a diagnosis that was unknown and uh, had not been described, let alone treated. And Frank Job uh, was the team doctor for the Dodgers, uh, and uh, he thought of weaving a new ligament using the palmaris tendon, which is the tendon here in our, our wrist. So he called up a hand surgeon he knew uh, and asked the hand surgeon to harvest Tommy's palmaris tendon. And then he weaved the palmaris tendon into a new ligament in his elbow. And sure enough, Tommy came back and had more wins after that surgery than he'd ever had before. So that was a, an innovation that changed the face of baseball medicine and perhaps really changed the face of sports medicine in general. Next, please. Uh, and that inspired me to seek to innovate and improve the field as well. Uh, I uh, uh, went into my career in sports medicine with that in mind, looked after the uh, Dodgers, Lakers, and Kings while in L.A. Next, please. And uh, then uh, in Chicago, I uh, have had the opportunity as uh, the founder and medical director of American Hip Institute to act as a second opinion doctor for the NFL. Next, please. Uh, and next again, and next again, uh, and uh, have uh, treated a, a number of uh, athletes from all the major sports leagues, uh, NFL, NBA, MLB, uh, NHL, next please, and also served as uh, head team physician for the Chicago Sky uh, for a seven year period where I had the opportunity to uh, look uh, women eye to eye, uh, which is uh, an unusual experience for a guy who's six foot seven. Uh, next please. Uh, now, what I realized in my career in sports medicine rather early on was that in the shoulder and the knee, for decades, 30 years, 40 years, we've approached these joints, next please, from the standpoint of restoring anatomy. So all the procedures that we do in the shoulder and the knee, a labor repair, a rotator cuff repair, an ACL reconstruction, these are all about restoring normal anatomy. Next please. In the hip, however, Traditionally, people had been told to wait until you need a total hip replacement. Here's a standard reaction from a patient to that advice. We live in an era today where people uh, are more active and stay more active for longer than ever before. And people are not happy with the, uh, the advice that you have early arthritis. You might need a hip replacement eventually, and there's nothing to do until then. Uh, now, obviously, there's the whole realm of non-arthritic hip injuries that we've come to understand in the last decade, where we've uh, been able to take patients who previously might have been given this advice, that there was nothing to do for them except wait for a hip replacement, and now we can treat them. We can diagnose them and we can treat them, and uh, we do that with the help of the therapist and the athletic trainer, and um, I'll continue to harp on the uh, importance of the therapist and the athletic trainer in obtaining that right diagnosis to get the patient there. Next, please. 
Um, so a couple rhetorical questions here. Firstly, is the hip an athletic joint? The answer is clearly and resoundingly yes. We in the past may have thought of uh, hip injuries as something that happened to our grandmother uh, and are only in the elderly. And clearly that is not the case. Uh, they uh, are injured in young athletic and middle-aged athletic people. The hip is the largest joint in the body. It's subject to the biggest loads in the body. Uh, it has a, a labrum and cartilage and tendons and ligaments, all the things that get injured in every other joint. So, of course, it gets uh, injured in uh, athletic, athletic people and athletes. Next, please. Here you see a couple of uh, uh, typical uh, motions of specific sports where you can see the loads and imagine the loads that are placed on the hip specifically. Next, please. Um, another rhetorical question, do non-athletes injure their hips? Not your grandmother, but regular average people. And here again, the answer is a resounding yes. Uh, next, please. Uh, people of all shapes and sizes injure their hips. Um, here's a, a worker sustain, sustaining a hip injury um, and certainly workers sustain hip injuries, but so does everyone else. Um, athletes, non-athletes, workers, uh, normal people um, sustain hip injuries at all different ages. Uh, and that has been invaluable to recognize. Next, please. Uh, so uh, a little over 10 years ago, uh, we created the American Hip Institute uh, Research Foundation. Uh, the American Hip Institute Research Foundation was, uh, was and is dedicated to uh, advancing the field of hip surgery, advancing the recognition and diagnosis of the injuries that I'll talk about in this talk, uh, and advancing the uh, surgical science to make available uh, treatments to more patients. Uh, about two years ago, we moved into the uh, new headquarters uh, by Rosemont and O'Hare. Uh, next, please. Uh, located right at the crossroads of 290, uh, 294 and uh, I-90. Um, and it was positioned at that junction of the highway so that it would be accessible to the entirety of Chicago land. We're, we're a very niche, very focused practice uh, that is focused on a very um, uh, narrow uh, field of, of hip injuries. And uh, we serve as a resource to all of Chicago land and and for that matter, much of the Midwest. Uh, so the accessibility to all patients uh, from a variety of geographies is uh, uh, very critical in serving our mission uh, at American Hip Institute. Um, so uh, next, please. Um, now, exercise clearly has benefits for the hip and for that matter, for all joints. It also has risks. And we saw that in our show of hands uh, virtually a moment ago. Next, please. So a little bit on the anatomy, uh, the very simple high level anatomy is that the hip is a ball and socket joint. The ball is the femoral head, the socket is the acetabulum, and the labrum is the ring of cartilage that uh, encircles the ball. So it's a rubbery ring that acts like a gasket, and it seals the ball in the socket, and it seals the lubricant fluid in the joint. Next, please. Hip impingement occurs when there is a mismatch in shape between the ball and socket, or when the hip is taken to the extremes of range of motion, like you see this young lady doing here. Next, please. Um, here you see uh, pincer type impingement where there's an abnormal shape of the rim of the socket. Next. And you can see that impinge when during joint motion. Next again. So I'm going to ask you uh, to click through these uh, slides and you'll see the motion of the joint that occurs where the green labrum is being crushed between the femoral neck and the acetabular rim. Keep on uh, clicking through, and you can see that uh, this motion occurs repetitively as the joint continues to move and the uh, labrum is crushed repetitively. That's fine, you can go to the next. Now this can occur in any of a variety of movements of the hip. Uh, here are some yoga positions uh, that uh, may stress the hip in various directions and in, uh, cause impingement in various directions, and of course, uh, impingement can occur in any sport, in any activity, uh, or even in our activities of daily living, like getting in and out of a car or tying our shoes. Next. 
so it's important to understand the motions that the individual uh, uh, athlete or non-athlete uh, incurs as a part of their uh, sport or as a part of their training or as a part of their day-to-day -day life. Next. Cam impingement uh, occurs when there's a mismatch in shape between the ball and socket caused by a deformity on the ball, on the femoral head. Next. Here you see a cam lesion where the uh, ball is out of round, and next you can see the cam lesion impinges here during joint motion. Next. Now, again, we'll click through some slides, but here you see an x-ray of a femoral head that's out of round, and as we click through the slides, you'll see that the cam lesion impinges against the labrum in a different way. It actually enters the joint and shears against the labrum and the adjacent cartilage, and it'll tear the labrum and adjacent cartilage uh, by a shear effect rather than a crush effect. So these are your two major types of impingement, cam type impingement and pincer type impingement. They can both occur in any of a variety of motions uh, of the hip, and we should carefully consider the motions of the individual uh, in their day-to-day -day life or in their sport in coaching them on how to avoid uh, impingement. And this is a big part of the non-surgical treatment and the preventative treatment that the physical therapist will undertake is figuring out what motions in that person's training or day-to-day -day life will cause impingement and teaching them how to live their life without causing the impingement, how to avoid them. Next. Uh, so when, when we seek to uh, treat these patients at the American Hip Institute, our treatment starts with the diagnosis. And a lot of these people have had uh, difficulty with diagnosis. Uh, that's where a, a big part of our contribution comes in. Next. Uh, hip injuries are perhaps uh, one of the most frequently missed or misdiagnosed problems in orthopedics today and hence present quite a big diagnostic dilemma. Next. Part of that is because our brains don't do a very good job of localizing hip pain. Uh, so we may feel pain in a classic C sign location where the patient takes their hand and cups it like a C to the side of their hip to show the location of the pain. That's called a C sign. We may also have pain laterally, anteriorly, or in the groin or uh, ridiculous pain down the leg. Uh, and that's why the uh, hip and hip pain can mimic so many other things. Next, please. Um, so it can mimic uh, back pain, radicular pain, uh, radiculopathy, uh, a, a groin pole, a hip flexor pole, a bursitis, a hernia, to, to name a few. But some of the typical complaints uh, are listed here. First of all, the onset can be chronic or acute. Prolonged sitting may be painful. Rising from a seated position may or may not cause pain or catching. There may be pain with rotational or torsional motions. They may have pain when getting in and out or out of a car. Uh, they may have catching or popping. Some patients may demonstrate painful intercourse, more commonly females than males, and they may have night pain. Next. Uh, you'll have to scroll through those, thanks. Next. So the physical examination here um, is uniquely challenging, and neither of these uh, photos are how we do a physical examination, uh, but are, are merely meant to make you laugh. Um, next, please. Uh, of course, how we do a physical examination is quite involved. Uh, it starts with bilateral range of motion, and this is important because we'll identify side-to-side -side differences in the range of motion. I typically do um, an internal and external rotation examination in the flexed position at 90 degrees of flexion. But we have to be careful to hold the knee in a fixed position while we do this, uh, because a, a patient who has limited uh, rotation may try to um, move their knee and uh, vary their abduction and adduction in order to get more rotation. So isolate the rotation by keeping the knee in a fixed location. Next. Um, here, uh, uh, we have a variety of different uh, tests shown uh, at the uh, top left. You see uh, the uh, resisted internal rotation test, uh, a test for gluteus medius pathology. Top middle is uh, lateral impingement with abduction. Top right is anterior, uh, um, anterior instability test with uh, extension and external rotation while the other knee is clutched to the chest. 
Uh, bottom left is uh, an anterior impingement test. Bottom middle is a log roll test. Uh, and um, bottom right is also a log roll test the other direction. Next, please. Uh, now, if there's one test that I'd like you to come away with from this presentation, it's the impingement test, the anterior impingement test. And this is ma maximal flexion, adduction, and internal rotation. So even if you're treating back pain or you're treating uh, shoulder problems or hand problems, learn this one test, this impingement test. You will pick up a lot of hip pathology, probably 80% of it or more, if you know this one test. So if somebody comes to you with a diagnosis of bursitis and they're not getting better, try an impingement test and see if it's their hip. If they come to you with a diagnosis of spinal radiculopathy and they keep on having pain, try an impingement test and see if it's their hip. Next, please. Now, there are many other uh, physical examination tests to do, and we've published and written a lot uh, on this, and I'd encourage you to uh, look, uh, look up some of the chapters that we've written on it, which are available on the American Hip Institute's website. If you go to the American Hip Institute and go to For Professionals, you can look up all the articles we've written on it. You'll find a lot of resources. But to name a few, always examine everyone's gait. I know you all do this. Uh, a lot of orthopedic surgeons, believe it or not, don't do this routinely. It's critical for us to examine uh, every patient's gait. We do the impingement tests, the anterior impingement test, lateral impingement test, posterior impingement test, the Faber test everyone's familiar with. Anterior apprehension is a little less familiar to some of us. Uh, that's prone external rotation and an anterior force. This is like an anterior drawer of the hip. Check the strength of the iliopsoas and the gluteus medius. And check for tenderness in all of these locations. The trochanter can be a sign of the gluteus medius terebrositis. The pubic symphysis can localize pubalgia or a sports hernia. The iliopsoas may localize tendonitis or pathologic snapping. Piriformis syndrome, the ASIS with sartorius pathology. These are all important areas to look for tenderness. But remember that tenderness is nonspecific. And somebody with a labral tear in their hip may have tenderness in any of these locations because of what's called Hilton's Law, which says that the pain coming from a joint may be felt in any of the muscles that cross that joint. Now, there are 27 muscles that cross the hip joint, and any of those muscles may be sore when a patient has pathology inside the hip joint, such as impingement or a labral tear. Next, please. So, as always, diagnosis is critical. I hope I've hammered home that point by this uh, stage in the presentation. And the physical therapist and athletic trainer and cl as clinicians are critical to obtaining the right diagnosis. Next, please. So I want to talk a little bit about what we treat in hip arthroscopy. And obviously, uh, there's no need for me to uh, teach you how to do a, a hip arthroscopy or teach you everything about hip arthroscopy. But having an awareness of the injuries we can treat is critical for the uh, therapist as well. So, next, please. Uh, so a labral tear. Next. Uh, that is a tear of this ring around the edge of the socket. This is probably the most common injury that we treat arthroscopically. And it's the common denominator of a lot of different injuries, a lot of different things that can cause labral tears. Next. Uh, so impingement is one of those things, which is a common cause of labral tears. Next. And in, uh, instability is another. Next. Um, cartilage damage often results from a labral tear and impingement. So when, when we damage the labrum, we lose the seal that seals the ball on the socket and seals the lubricant fluid in the joint. So imagine if you lose the lubrication of the joint, then you wear away the cartilage. So cartilage damage often occurs next after a labrum becomes torn. Gluteus medius tears, probably the most commonly missed diagnosis that we have in hip arthroscopy. The gluteus medius is a big muscle. Everyone on this call knows uh, what the gluteus medius is and what it does and why it's important. A lot of, a lot of orthopedic surgeons overlook it. Um, it's not thought of a lot in the field of orthopedic surgery. And a lot of people with gluteus medius tears are diagnosed with trochanteric bursitis. They may get a cortisone injection. They may get 10 cortisone injections. They likely will get sent to you for physical therapy. 
But when you see that they're not getting better with physical therapy, and especially if they're not getting better with therapy and injections, you have to suspect that there's a gluteus medius tear that's underlying it. Next. So stem cells, PRP, and growth factors, these are all advanced modalities that we have in the non-surgical treatment. And these can work very synergistically with physical therapy. So uh, every patient that I treat with biologics, uh, such as stem cells and PRP, gets sent uh, to physical therapy afterward, uh, and the, the two work in, in harmony uh, together. So you'll see a lot of people with, for example, partial thickness tears of the gluteus medius that I've treated with uh, PRP or stem cells and then sent to you for physical therapy, and you'll see that they're getting better in your physical therapy. And uh, you'll ask yourself, is it because of the therapy or is it because of the PRP? Well, it's both. Uh, most of these people have already tried therapy before they get um, the biologic injections, but uh, the synergy of the two uh, works very well for uh, many diagnoses, especially uh, partial thickness tears of the gluteus medius and early arthritis. Next. Um, so uh, short video on hip arthroscopy, but what is hip arthroscopy? Arthroscopic surgery, as you all know, means using a camera inside a joint using keyhole incisions. And in arthroscopy of the hip, we can accomplish a lot of different things, but arthroscopy of the hip is more technically difficult than arthroscopy of the shoulder or knee because the hip joint is a deeper joint and it's a tighter joint and it's a curved joint. So arthroscopy in the hip is extremely technical. It is not a field that should be dabbled in. It's not something for, for uh, any surgeon who does sports medicine to just put a scope in another uh, joint. It is very much its own field uh, and um, very much requires its own expertise and its own uh, training, which is why we have a fellowship at the American Hip Institute. Our uh, orthopedic surgeon fellows spend a year with us training specifically in hip arthroscopy and joint restoration uh, because of the degree of technical challenge in really doing this surgery well and doing it right. Uh, next, please. We also focus uh, heavily on advances in robotic hip replacement. Um, we were the first in the nation to perform outpatient robotic hip replacement, uh, and that has been a huge thrust for the American Hip Institute. Next. Uh, we uh, have innovated this using not robots like this, but next, uh, please, robots like this. Um, this is the Mako robot, uh, which is a unit that allows us to customize the hip replacement to the individual's anatomy and then to implant the components with a, a extremely high degree of precision. So we can measure things to the millimeter and get leg lengths perfect to the millimeter, for example. Uh, a lot of complications of hip replacement occur because of inaccuracies in how the components were uh, placed. So dislocations, leg length discrepancies, and, and even just not feeling like it's a great or perfect hip. All of those things result from subtle inaccuracies in the placement of the components. And with the robotic hip replacement that we've uh, innovated at American Hip Institute, we've seen a 94% reduction in the inaccuracies using that technique. Next, please. And here, a short video showing a little bit about how we do the robotics. Uh, so you can see in the uh, video on the left, we do the planning using a computerized 3D virtual model of the patient's hip and pelvis. We do the procedure through a, a minimal incision, uh, usually a two to three inch incision. We go between the muscles. We don't cut any muscles around the hip and we implant the components through this minimal incision. Um, so that we can do it as an outpatient procedure. The patients go home the same day. They put full weight on it uh, the same day. They sleep in their own bed that night. That's important always. It's especially important during the coronavirus pandemic. Uh, and we can avoid the risk of hospital-borne infections this way and avoid patients being uh, around COVID patients in a hospital setting. Next. So uh, I will come back again to my central point of this talk that the physical therapists and athletic trainers are the most important piece of the medical care because 
they can obtain the right diagnosis and help a patient who has an incorrect or incomplete diagnosis get the right diagnosis and hence get the right treatment. They can't get the right treatment without the right diagnosis. It's very important. Next, please. Um, so uh, I'll tell you a quick story ab about a team approach uh, and why a team approach is important. Uh, during my time with the uh, Kings, the LA Kings, I was uh, uh, the first in the locker room during uh, uh, one of the breaks between periods. And uh, in, that, uh, in that break, the uh, goalie came off the ice, French-Canadian guy, and he says, uh, Doc, my heart is palpitating. Uh, and now normally in the locker room, we've got an internist and an orthopedic surgeon and a dentist and uh, every kind of doctor you can imagine. But for whatever reason, on this particular occasion, I was the only doctor in the locker room. Uh, so he comes to me and the whole team, and all the other players and all the athletic trainers are all watching. And I take his pulse and his pulse is 150. So uh, I figure... He's in an arrhythmia. Next, please. Uh, so my, I think back to my uh, medical school training because I'm an orthopedic surgeon, not a cardiologist. And what did I learn for vagal maneuvers uh, in medical school? Next, please. Um, the most common vagal maneuver to uh, snap someone out of an arrhythmia is a carotid massage where you massage their carotid artery. But there are, in fact, like five or six uh, different vagal maneuvers uh, in the uh, in every textbook, and um, uh, the one that happened to pop into my head at first is probably at the very bottom of that list, and it's the eyeball rub. Uh, so, for whatever reason, that was the vagal maneuver I thought of first. So I lay this goalie down, and I start rubbing his eyeballs, and I rub his eyeballs for about ten seconds. And um, uh, next, please, he uh, snaps up. And he says, Doc, I think I'm all better. And sure enough, uh, his uh, heart was uh, heart rate was back to 70 and uh, he was snapped out of his arrhythmia. Um, so I tell that you this story uh, because although uh, this story had a happy ending and uh, the eyeball rub did, in fact, uh, take him out of his uh, tachycardia, the best treatment for patients, for athletes and for non-athletes involves a team approach. In this case, the ideal would have been to have the cardiologist present, of course. And in our ideal uh, situation, treating orthopedic problems and especially hip problems, next please, uh, a team approach benefits the patient. Uh, now, the athlete you, hear, you see here is at the top of uh, the uh, team approach, but I put the physical therapist and athletic trainer in the center. They're, they're the central cog in the wheel between the athlete, the surgeon, the sports team, and, and the family. They're, the physical therapist and athletic trainer are often the central hub of communication between all these parties. They're the party that probably sees the athlete the most. Uh, and, and hence, do not underestimate how critical you are in this successful team approach to every patient and every athlete. Next, please. Uh, that, that team approach is something that we very much espouse at the American Hip Institute. And because of that, I, I want to know all of you and I want all of you to know me and I want you to know all of our doctors uh, at American Hip Institute. Uh, I'd like to invite all of you to shadow Institute. Uh, both in the uh, in the clinic uh, and in surgery, and also uh, in physical therapy, where uh, our ATI physical therapists uh, have the opportunity to treat hips all day, every day. So they really uh, are national experts in physical therapy for the hip, and it's it's great to spend time with with them, with me, with uh, any of our doctors in all of those uh, settings. Next, please. Um, so um, to wrap up, the American Hip Institute as the first clinic in the nation dedicated exclusively to hip injuries uh, is currently the number one center in the country by volume for hip arthroscopy and uh, has the largest uh, successful outcomes published ever uh, in uh, worldwide in hip arthroscopy with over 10,000 patients treated uh, to date. So I, American Hip Institute aims to serve as a resource for all of you, uh, HI has uh, had a partnership with ATI for over 10 years, uh, and that that partnership has benefit, benefited thousands of patients because as we work together with this team approach, uh, with your help, we're able to help patients 
get, get, get the correct diagnosis, and ultimately get the treatment that they need at a very, very high level. Next, please. So um, on that note, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak with you today and uh, to work with all of you at ATI. Yeah. Interesting with the, the going on. Thank you so much, Dr. Dome, for, for the presentation to really talk about the, the evolution of hip treatment. And, and I think all of us that have been in the field for, for a while can agree that for a long time it was, oh, well, you have hip pain and you've gone through all the different pieces, eh, you know, have at it. And it's really been encouraging to see the expansion and evolution of uh, hip arthroscopy and, and kind of restoring the door of anatomy. Thinking about where the field has come in your career, uh, including the use of orthobiologics and, and robot assisted and, and things like that. Where do you see the innovation will be over the next five to 10 years? What do you expect will change in your practice, you know, in the upcoming, you know, decade or so that, that will push outcomes and, and patient benefit that much farther? Uh, it's a great question. Thank you very much. Um, so I, 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 we're working on a lot of different innovations at any given time. Uh, for, from a procedure standpoint, we've um, uh, quite recently perfected the technique for ligamentum teres reconstruction. Uh, I believe the uh, ligamentum teres is the ACL of the, the hip. Uh, and uh, I think 10 years from now, we'll be reconstructing the ligamentum teres uh, as often as we reconstruct an ACL. Um, uh, this is a procedure that I did as recently as yesterday. Uh, I, I think that uh, globally, uh, speaking as a take a step back, one of the biggest uh, innovations that uh, we will have is patient specific treatment uh, where we can uh, uh, work with a, an algorithm that predicts a patient's outcome based on that patient. So m most of orthopedics today and most of um, medicine for that matter practices what we refer to as evidence-based medicine. What evidence-based medicine means is when you ask me what will be your outcome with uh, an arthroscopic surgery of the hip? I quote a paper, I quote a study, and the study is a study on 100 other patients. Uh, and it, I tell you what was the percentage success rate in those 100 other patients. And we um, uh, extrapolate that you might have uh, a similar likelihood of success. But those 100 patients are not you. The, you are your own distinct uh, uh, person and unique person. So what we have uh, developed at American Hip Institute and are in process of putting into uh, use is a patient-specific algorithm to predict outcome of any given surgery so that I can take your specifics, your age, your, um, your gender, your size, the, the type of tear you have, the uh, um, medical history that you have, and pl plug all of those things into uh, the algorithm, into the computer-based algorithm, and it can tell you your predicted success rate with X procedure is 95%. Um, your uh, predicted need for uh, hip replacement in the next 10 years is 5% uh, and uh, so forth, so that we can actually give a patient-specific recommendation that is tailored specifically to you. Um, I think that that's going to be a big advance, uh, certainly in hip surgery, but I think it's going to go beyond hip surgery and the, the patient-specific tailoring uh, of, of outcomes uh, will, um, I think, affect all of orthopedic uh, surgery. Uh, lastly, uh, from a procedural standpoint, we've um, uh, worked very hard at implementing uh, robotics and incorporating uh, advanced technologies like robotics into uh, hip replacements, and that has made a quantum difference uh, in the in the outcomes. And a, a, again, a 94% reduction in the risk of inaccuracies. I, I think we will continue to incorporate advanced technologies like robotics at even greater levels and higher levels, and they'll become integral. Uh, to today, uh, robotics. Uh, are um, still not part of uh, most procedures performed in most places. And even when they are performed, uh, they're, they're used in uh, only to a limited uh, degree. Um, we use the uh, robotics fully. It's uh, every part of the
procedure is performed using the robotics, and that that's how we were able to make such a, a difference in the outcomes. I think uh, it is our goal uh, to help spread that knowledge through the field of orthopedics and to make those uh, advanced technologies available to more patients and more doctors. Excellent. Thank you for sharing your perspective. Are you okay just for a few minutes of, of questions or I know we're, we're get up against time. Um, if people want to utilize the chat box for teams, I'm, I'm happy to to kind of read those off as they come in um, while you might be typing that out. You know, Dr. Dome, you spoke a lot about how physical therapists and athletic trainers spend the most amount of time with these patients are, and are really in a, in a critical role for both the, the diagnosis of making sure someone is responding and, and getting the appropriate care, but then also after a surgery or after a referral has been made, really tracking whether that person is trending in the right direction or, or not. Speaking specifically of patient status post hip arthroscopy, what are the things that you would like a physical therapist or an athletic trainer to communicate to you when a patient is not following the normal expected trajectory? And, and what is the mode of communication? What is the timing of communication for someone you know that's still having elevated pain levels? They're being compliant with what they need to be doing with precautions. They're not someone who's way off the reservation. You know, what's kind of those important timelines that you'd really like to hear from us? And, you know, what's the best way to get that information to you? This is, uh, uh, your question is after a hip arthroscopy, correct? Yeah, specifically. I yeah. mean, we can take it in general, but I figured an example would be easiest. Yeah, sure. Um, good question. So, uh, first of all, more communication is always better, and uh, I maintain a very open door uh, policy, and uh, I, I'm uh, trying to be easy to reach. Uh, so, uh, and, and I think that's just good medicine. It, it facilitates the um, the team approach that I've uh, talked a lot about uh, during this talk. I, I think more interaction between the uh, surgeon and therapist is is always better. Uh, so uh, a lot of you have my cell phone number. Uh, if you don't, I'll give it to you. It's 646-662-4242. Uh, Again, 646-662-4242. No problem if you ever want to call me or, or text me. Um, and of course, uh, we have great resources and staff at the American Hip Institute as well. Uh, so you can always call um, or, or email uh, info at American Hip Institute and uh, we'll get the message taken care of. Uh, info at American Hip Institute dot com. Uh, so uh, now that I've made clear that uh, the, any therapist should always feel welcome to communicate at any time, I'll, I'll tell you a couple things to expect. Um, so firstly, you go through kind of the early phase, uh, patients working through post-surgical pain, that's normal. Um, after hip arthroscopy specifically, it is very common for people to have a little bit of a flare-up or a relapse sometime between six and 10 weeks post-op. And this is, a, anyone who has treated a bunch of people after hip arthroscopy has, has seen this at times. Um, and it's really important to, to know it's coming it's so common that we even put it in our uh, post-op instructions for patients so they won't be surprised. And when a, when a patient has this kind of flare-up, it's important for the therapist not to be surprised. And that way they can comfort the patient and encourage them and tell them, this is normal. Don't worry about it. Uh, we'll, we'll back off a little bit and then you'll work your way through it. Um, another thing uh, that's common is to experience um, uh, irritation of the iliopsoas and or rectus femoris uh, at any point during the uh, recovery. And we actually try to avoid working those muscles during probably the first three or four months after surgery. So you, you'll want to work on their gluteus medius muscles, uh, for example, and you'll want to isolate them uh, without firing the iliopsoas and rectus femoris. And you all know how to do that. I don't have to uh, tell you how to do that. Um, but um, uh, common to experience irritation there. So I think um, uh, to your question, when is somebody off track or when are they going off the reservation? That's when they're getting worse and continuing to get worse um, or they're getting past the 12 week mark uh, and they're still not seeing any improvement at all. Um, uh, th those are times where we start to scratch our heads um, and uh, I, you'll see in all of our physical therapy protocols, 
uh, that uh, we have a lot of detail, a lot of phases of the program and a lot of um, uh, exercises that are recommended at each stage. But before every stage, at the very beginning, is uh, the, uh, aligned to the effect of uh, always per the discretion of the physical therapist, because you all go to school for a long time. You have, you have great experience. You have great knowledge of physical therapists. You have knowledge that, that surgeons don't have and experience that surgeons don't have. So we want to, I, I want to empower the physical therapist to, to use their extensive knowledge and to use their uh, ability to ascertain what is the problem. Sometimes uh, it's a surgical problem, but often it's not. Often it's a, a problem with muscle imbalances or, uh, or pelvic tilt or core strength, uh, things that the physical therapist is expert at identifying uh, and uh, treating. So uh, I, I always want the physical therapist to feel empowered to use their expertise. And uh, again, to bring it home to your question, I do always want uh, to have an open line of communication between uh, the surgeon at American Hip Institute and the physical therapist at whichever clinic it may be.